The 16th Street Church bombing was a big bomb that felt like it was just a block away. Support provided for flashbacks and tributes from the summer of 63 is made possible by Parker, Poe, Adams, and Bernstein, a full-service law firm serving the Southeast from offices in Charlotte, Raleigh, Columbia, Charleston, Spartanburg, and Washington, D.C. At Parker, Poe, we seek a better future for our clients and our community. On the web at www.parkerpoe.com. And additional support is made possible by the Arts and Science Council of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County and by PBS Charlotte viewers like you. Thank you. Nighttime provided the dark cloak of cover for a deadly daylight assault. I knew three of the girls who were killed. The violated inside of this church had no time to prepare. When you lose someone like that, you know, there is no lifting of a burden. Bold print spelled out the issues of deep pain felt in the city of Birmingham. Our system of justice is something we pride ourselves on. But there is no question that 50 years ago, our system of justice let people down. Everybody knew one of those little girls. One very famous Birmingham resident recalls the youthful fear in the hometown where she once lived. What I remember most is asking my parents, why do they hate us? so much and my father saying there are just hateful people they're hateful men and then asking to sleep in my parents bed that night lawmakers in washington took the sacrifices to heart this was one of the true american stories and here in the people's house two representatives from alabama a white man and an african-american woman have joined together to see that these favorite daughters will always shine in the hearts and in the history of our nation. Anniversaries do showcase struggle, but they also offer the importance of unfinished business. Every day in cities and towns across this country, the struggle for equal rights, equal opportunity, and equal justice goes on. What happened at this church in 1963 was not called a hate crime. And back then, the words domestic terrorism had not made it onto the cultural landscape. Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Crump. It was a moment of violence that resulted in innocence being lost at a time our nation was in search of itself. Here in Birmingham, 2013 offered a series of reflective moments through church services, public dedications, and community forums to keep the memories alive. The trouble that unfolded here on September 15, 1963, continues to provide teachable moments as so many remember the four girls in many circles who have become the Sunday morning martyrs. That's her last picture. Uh, she was, she was 14. Diane Braddock keeps the memories of her sister, Carol Robertson, alive. She was among the four girls who died on that September morning during a dynamite explosion at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The heinous act of violence also claimed the lives of Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, and Addie Mae Collins. That premeditated attack against this place of worship brought more negative attention to Birmingham, but away from the church, another section of town endured its share of hate and hardship. The area in where I live was called uh, Dynamite Hill. That is the distinctive title given to Center Street North. During the 1960s, Southern bombings were not referred to as domestic terrorism, but the intent and motive were clear. My father kept all of his, his letters in a briefcase, and I decided that we needed to preserve them. Barbara Shores is another one who clings to past memories. Her father was well-known civil rights attorney, Arthur Shores. Life in the family's home on Center Street back then carried its share of unpredictable risk. We would just be sitting in this room and someone would shoot through the window. The daytime hours were, were fairly, fairly normal. It was the nighttime hours that provided us uh, uh, the first indication of fear. Jeff Drew and his family also lived on Center Street. 
Like other families along this block involved in the civil rights movement, they too became the targets of organized resistance. We look for trouble with shoeboxes and dynamite uh, 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 with clocks in them. We looked for anything unusual. No one knew from day to day what might happen. Uh, you had the leaders of the movement that were living there, the, the, the Birmingham movement. Uh, you had leaders from the national movement that were coming in. Uh, and as, as the movement grew, so did the violence. At the home of Arthur Shores, a late night attack rocked several rooms. Uh, I was in the kitchen, my father was in the living room, and my mother was in the bedroom. When the bomb went off, I knew the drill hit the floor and crawled to safety. Inside this home came the frayed emotions of panic and uncertainty. Detailed accounts are expressed in this tribute to her father titled, The Gentle Giant of Dynamite Hill. It was co-authored with her sister, Judge Helen Shores Lee. They vividly recall what happened to their mother, Theodora, who was jolted from her bed. When she fell out of bed, she hit the corner of the, uh, her nightstand, and a chandelier ball came and hit her in the head, too. So she had a concussion. My house was about three blocks over from Center Street, but when that bomb went off, you could hear it all over the community. But one thing I'll always remember, and, and have never gotten it out of my head, and it was almost like when the bomb went off, the smell of the dynamite went straight up my nose and burned my eyes even. That blast was the second one to hit the Shores home. It came 11 days before all hell broke loose at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Frozen reminders of a town's troubled past are widely spotlighted at Kelly Ingram Park. It sits just across the street from the 16th Street Baptist Church. And this park was the well-known staging area for public acts of civil disobedience. If protesters who put so much on the line in their quest for first-class citizenship could be labeled as the brave protagonist, history has clearly identified Birmingham's police commissioner Eugene Bull Connor as the main antagonist. His goal was maintaining the status quo. We were not afraid of taking risks. It was important to understand the, the goal that we were trying to achieve, which was a, a peaceful protest of an unjust law. And so that required a, a togetherness, solidarity, and tenacity. of Alabama campus at Tuscaloosa is under a tight security guard of state police as Governor George Wallace appeals for calm. Mountains were moved 57 miles away from Birmingham in Tuscaloosa in June of 1963. Federal troops arrived at the University of Alabama campus to help open the doors of the college for African-American students. Moments that help usher in sweeping winds of change. In the spring of 1963, the, the Jim Crow legislation, the grim, Jim Crow laws we had in the Birmingham started to break down, and they started to break down in part because the world started focusing on Birmingham, and business leaders here finally decided enough is enough, and that we've got to change our community or the city will die. During the spring of that year, Martin Luther King Jr. called out the town's establishment over a system of inequality and his now famous letter from Birmingham jail. Dr. King was on a roll near the end of the summer. I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. 18 days later, it all seemed to crash in the blink of an eye. That's when the raw emotions of sorrow wailed from a well-established church sanctuary. Well, I was in New York with uh, my aunt, and uh, my mother called, and she told my aunt what happened, and my aunt told me, and it was just, you know, devastating. These kids were innocent, and for something like that to happen, so it was just unbelievable, frightening. 
The 16th Street Church bombing was a big bomb that felt like it was just a block away. And so it rattled houses and broke windows and we knew that it wasn't in the, on the Dynamite Hill area, but we wondered where could such a blast have taken place. I knew exactly what it was. You know, I think I fainted, but when I came, got myself back together and all, um, you know, we knew exactly who did it. At 14, her sister, Carol Robertson, was one of the two teenagers to die in the attack. At least two of the girls that were killed in that bombing were classmates of mine at Wilkerson School. And, and we knew from knowledge of the parents that that day that some people had, some friends of ours, some classmates had been killed. Funerals for the girls in Birmingham came days later, and so did memorial services across the country. However, closure in the Jefferson County criminal justice system would follow a timetable all its own. Commemorations can be bittersweet. In Birmingham, the extended weekend of observances not only acknowledge the loss of innocent lives, but the public gatherings also demonstrated how a community once bitterly divided came together a half century later. Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed day of dedication to the memories of four little girls who unknowingly became sacrificial lambs on the altar of justice. One day before the official anniversary, local residents and out-of-town dignitaries gathered in Kelly Ingram Park. Almost 50 years had passed, and there still had not been a monument to the little girls. On the front row were the parents of Denise McNair and Sarah Collins Rudolph, who was injured in the bomb blast. She is the sister of Eddie Mae Collins. While the occasion spotlighted pain of years gone by, local leaders took time to celebrate a city's progress. We want to recognize that sacrifice that allowed me to be in City Hall, that allowed those of us who work in the corporate community to work in the corporate community, that allow us to go to non-HBCU colleges to go to those colleges, that allow all of us just to gather in this place. We could not, not have done this in 1963. What many in this crowd did was help raise a quarter of a million dollars through the Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham to honor the lives that were lost by dedicating a sculpture that goes by the title Four Spirits. A monument that will become four spirits of hope, peace, reconciliation, and love not just for our community, but it might become a vision that a vision that will one day forever be part of all of us. Summing up the occasion fell on the shoulders of a civil rights icon who was once a Birmingham minister. I understand that four little girls have served such a glorious purpose in helping our nation turn from the aristocracy of color to the aristocracy of character. Images and names are part of the standing tribute. The brother of Cynthia Morris Wesley says the public acknowledgement eases a weighty burden. A lot of pain. A lot of pain and, and a, a great relief. Two other victims who died violently that day are remembered in this space. Virgil Ware and Johnny Robinson were murdered hours after the attack at the church. Recognition also came to those who survived the explosion. My father was the pastor here and I was here that Sunday and in the uh, basement where the kids were when the dynamite went off. It rattled windows, woke people up, and shook the streets at the old A.G. Gaston Motel, named after prominent Alabama businessman Arthur George Gaston. The A.G. Gaston Motel was right across the street where my dad worked and happened to be there right uh, when the bomb exploded. When I, when I saw my daddy running down that street, I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I was okay. 
because my daddy was coming. And in his arms, I was okay. And like I defied the police when I came out of this door, this door, when he said, nigga, get back down in there, and I ran right past him. So that my dad say, when they tried to stop him from crossing this street, he said, those are my sons, those are my boys. I need to go and check on them and check and see if they're okay. Other memorials are located on the church property, but one important accolade came from Washington. And to the families who are here today, uh, those who lost daughters, sisters, you know, we just want to express, you know, incredible thanks, not only for uh, the, the strength you showed in suffering, but also for your persistence in making sure that uh, we remember those sacrifices. And, and this is just a great moment. And it was President Barack Obama who signed legislation awarding the Congressional Gold Medal to the four girls weeks before the anniversary. The U.S. Capitol provided the backdrop for a stirring ceremony. Once again, our children have led us to this simplest of notions. They bring us together. They give us hope uh, when, uh, when ours runs out. No, we didn't need a medal to reaffirm uh, this order of things, but we could always use a solid gold reminder. And while we know that we can never be able to replace the life's loss or the injury suffered, we do know that this gold medal will serve as a compelling reminder that the price of freedom is never free. Back in Birmingham, voices from the nation's capital could also be heard. The nation's transportation secretary, Anthony Fox, said the church attack opened the door for common ground. What happened that day is unthinkable. The ironic thing about those events, though, was in many ways before they happened, we were different. But on that day, we became the same. Parents. It was um, a Sunday that, at the beginning, was like any other Sunday, and um, a few hours later would be like no other Sunday. During a roundtable conversation, Memories came from a Birmingham native who was here in 63. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was a classmate of Denise McNair. From that moment on in Birmingham, there was no sanctuary. There was no place that was really safe. Um, we didn't go out at night anymore. Um, you stayed home, and if you went out, you made sure you were home before it became dark. On the big screen, the Alabama Theater played host to the HBO film, Four Little Girls. It was produced and directed by Spike Lee. As a filmmaker, I never tell audience what to think. I respect their intelligence, and they're going to think what they're going to think. However, the people of Birmingham think very highly of Spike Lee. Before rolling the film, he was presented with a bronze duplicate of the Congressional Gold Medal. I love the love I'm getting from Birmingham. My Alabama folks. But you know what? I can't accept this. And I want this. I want Mrs. Fred Shulsworth to receive this. Now, if you see the film, he gets lost in the sauce. Fred Shuttlesworth was in there fighting. The late Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth was one of the engineers of a movement that brought change in Birmingham, and his likeness takes up prominent space outside of the city's Civil Rights Institute. Two lively services were carried out at the 16th Street Baptist Church on the day that marked the 50th anniversary. Getting a seat at this place of worship proved to be a challenge on the afternoon 
of September 15th, 2013. We had a unified community, but this was crunch time. And when Dr. King went to jail, there had been about 500 people who stood up in church claiming to go with him, but only about <laughs> less than 50 showed up. And I think only four preachers. And, um, but that was as it was. Most of the preachers were already in jail. Former UN ambassador and Atlanta mayor Andrew Young returned to his Alabama roots. While it was a day showcasing a community's pain, many noticed a city's progress. Residents here have put in office a number of black elected officials, including Mayor William Bell and U.S. Representative Terry Sewell. That was out of the realm of possibility in 1963, and so was having a U.S. Attorney General of color by the name of Eric Holder. And it's important that we mark the anniversaries of this and other milestones, from Selma to Birmingham to Tuscaloosa to the March on Washington, not because we wish to dwell on an imperfect past, but because like the heroes who once stood in these pews and took to this city's streets, braving threats, beatings, fire hoses, dogs, bullets, and bombs, we too love this country. That is what moved people in 1963. That is the same year Holder's sister-in-law, Vivian Malone, would be one of two black students admitted to the University of Alabama. Families here who still endure the disappointment of that day leave remembrances like this with a number of important takeaways. Sarah Collins Rudolph lost an eye in the blast and blames the death of her sister, Addie Mae Collins, on blatant intolerance. If we had a love one another then, those girls would still be alive. But it just showed us that only hate brings death. Mm -hmm. Only hate brings injury like what I got out the bombing. But we should just come together and live in peace. Another sister of one of the bombing victims believes that the legacy of these four girls are tied to the lessons of never giving up. We honor their legacy by teaching our children that the fight is not over, that they must continue, we must continue to struggle for voting rights, for jobs, for civil rights in this country. As the nation takes notice and reflects on a series of historic events, healing and closure remains an ongoing exercise in Birmingham, Alabama. Successfully prosecuting Robert Chambliss, Thomas Blanton, and Bobby Cherry required decades of patience. Slow justice was the norm during this investigation because convicting and sending this trio to prison for life took nearly 39 years. Doug Jones prosecuted two of the cases. The white power structure, the white law enforcement, they didn't give a damn about investigating the death of a black kid or a black man or a black woman in many cases. They just did the perfunctory routine thing and closed the files. Despite the obvious pain and intended slice of the past, city leaders in downtown Birmingham are taking pride in recognizing struggles, both public and personal. Well, I just remember that smile, you know, how we would uh, joke and tease and laugh at different things, and that, I just, that's her smile. It's not just Carol Robertson's youthful smile, but her sister, Diane Robertson Braddock, has added a replica of the Congressional Gold Medal to a collection of family keepsakes. To sign that bill, enabling the girls to be honored posthumously with the Congressional Medal of Honor, that was a bipartisan effort. The votes were unanimous in both houses, the Senate and House. And so, why is it that we can come together for that, but we can't work together for all of these other pressing issues? Previous hardships in this city are held in high esteem. Standing placards across Birmingham go the extra mile in honoring those who never made it into the headlines. You hear about the foot soldiers, and they're beginning to get more recognition, but it was so many people 
who were involved that you're just now beginning to hear about, which is great. One of the placards can be found in the front of the home of Barbara Shores. It honors her father, attorney Arthur Shores, and the trail of history acknowledges the violence on Center Street North, known in many places as Dynamite Hill. An innocent child in a church bombing, who, that, who, who could ever think of such a hideous event? And more than a half century later, lifelong residents like Jeff Drew still weigh the symbolism behind great personal sacrifice. It is the lesson. Those girls gave their lives so that we might be free. The loss of those young lives clearly demonstrates the price and sacrifice of freedom, even on domestic soil. Time has a way of easing a very painful burden. Back in 1963, this was a place of hardship and heartbreak, but more than 50 years later, it has now become a very special place of worship where healing can be found. That's flashbacks and tributes from the summer of 63, remembering the Sunday morning martyrs from the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm Steve Crump. Thanks so much for joining us.